Good evening and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight and braving the rain, which we did not expect. My name is Scott Ashton. I'm the CEO of the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce, and we're very excited to have you all here tonight. Thank you. Uh, this, evening's, this evening's event is a collaboration of 10 Chambers of Commerce in North San Diego and South Orange County, as well as Miracosta College. So let's have a big round of applause for our host. Before I introduce our moderator for this evening, I'd like to start by thanking our candidates, Representative Mike Levin and Brian Marriott, for taking the time out of their schedules to be here. And again, to our, to our host, Miracosta College, for providing this great venue, particularly uh, Kristen Hike and Terrence Shaw. And a special thanks to Brett Schausenbach from the Carlsbad Chamber and Rachel Beld from the Vista Chamber, who both played integral roles in the planning of the forum, and Susie Lance from the San Clemente Chamber, who's serving as our timer this evening. Um, and just a quick acknowledgement of all the chambers that came together to uh, put on tonight's event. Uh, the Carlsbad Chamber, Dana Point Chamber, Encinitas, Laguna Niguel, Oceanside, San Clemente, San Juan Capistrano, Solana Beach, and Vista Chamber of Commerce. Wow, wow, wow. Great. At this time, I'd like to introduce Monse Ayala from the Miracosas Associated Student Government for tonight's land acknowledgement. Monse? Hello everyone, my name is Montserrat Ayala. I'm Miracosa's um, student government body president. Um, excuse me while I read from my phone, um, but I would like to welcome all of you tonight to our lovely campus. I'm so glad to see this all after coronavirus and I'm glad to see everyone here and present and so many people coming out for this debate. I think it's a very important time and I'm so glad to see you all here. So just a quick land and management today. We acknowledge the original caretakers of the land on which Miracosta College is built. The Luiseño people are made of seven bands, the La Jolla, Pala, Pauma, Pechenga, Rincón, San Luis Rey, and Soboba. We pay our respects to the Luiseño past, present, and future, and are grateful to have the opportunity to be part of this community and to honor their history, culture, and spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Monse, I appreciate that. It's now my honor to introduce our moderator, uh, Priya Sridhar. Is, uh, Priya is an Emmy award-winning political reporter and host of Politically Speaking, a weekly political show that airs on Sundays on NBC7. She comes to NBC San Diego from KPPS, where she worked as a general assignment reporter and fill-in host for the station's radio and television programs. Priya is originally from outside Boston, Massachusetts, she is an officer in the United States Navy Reserve. And yes, round of applause. <laughs> and, and fell in love with San Diego through her work in the Navy. She is the co-president of Asian American Journalists Association of San Diego on the board of directors for Mili military veterans and journalism and was selected to be a term member for the Council on Foreign Relations. Please help me welcome Priya Sridhar. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. As you guys know, we're here for the 49th congressional debate. We have two candidates running in the debate, uh, running in the race, I should say, incumbent representative Mike Levin and a familiar face to many of you, candidate Brian Marriott. Each candidate tonight, all right, I want to go over some rules so you guys know what's about to happen. So each candidate tonight will get two minutes to give us an opening statement. Then we have several questions that we've prepared and they're going to get two minutes to answer those questions. Lastly, you, the audience, can submit questions. We've left some time at the end to try to squeeze in questions that you might want to get asked. To submit a question, it must be in writing. We have notepads and pens. You can see the volunteers holding them up. If you guys want to raise your hands, who's sub yep. 
So there you go. If you want to submit some questions, I know we've already gotten some. If you would like to ask a question, please don't single out any particular candidate. Format it so that they can both answer it, and then give it back to the volunteers. We're going to do our best to get to as many questions as we can. I want to make some notes about civil discourse tonight. So we expect great behavior from everyone, the candidates, the audience, everybody. We recognize that there's a great diversity of views, opinions, and stances these candidates have taken. However, we're here to civilly discuss them and debate them. The chambers are adamant that there will be no booing, hissing, jeering, or any other form of interrupting the candidates as they share their views. We can be in tonight. We will be a community that embraces diversity with respect and decorum. All right, candidates, Susie Lance, the CEO of the San Clemente Chamber of Commerce, will serve as your timekeeper. She's going to give a sign when you guys have 30 seconds left, and then again when you're down to 15 seconds. And lastly, she's going to be holding up a stop sign. So please stop so that I don't have to cut you off. <laughs> and with that, let's begin. So candidates, you have two minutes to give us your intro. Um, before the session, do you know who won the coin? Did we do a coin toss? Did we not do a coin toss? We'll do one right now. Do we have a coin? <laughs> Elise? <laughs> Susie, will you do the honors? No, I, there you go. Scott. All right. Sure. Heads. Don't get it in the All right. I'm touching it. It is heads. All right. So would you like to go first? First. All right. So, um... You, can, you have two minutes to give an introductory statement, and you can begin now. Well, thank you so much for coming, everybody. I want to uh, thank Miracosta College, just an extraordinary institution, so grateful to, to partner with you, uh, and all 10 Chambers of Commerce as well. That's really remarkable that we're all here together uh, this evening. I want to thank my amazing wife, Chrissy, uh, without whom any of this uh, would be impossible. Uh, and when we decided, because I say we, because it's, it's a family decision, when we decided five years ago we were going to run for office. It was to help the people who need it and to try to solve the problems that we're facing in this community. Despite the extreme rhetoric that you hear in Washington, D.C., I still believe that we can bring people together and get big things done. And that's what we have done. I created a bipartisan caucus to address getting the nuclear waste at San Onofre off our coast once and for all. I have passed 20 bipartisan bills signed by both the former president and by the current president. Everything from helping our veterans uh, to helping our environment uh, to helping get health care costs under control. Uh, we passed hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, worth of appropriations that have benefited this district, including through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Chips and Science Act that will deliver great jobs of the future right here and the Inflation Reduction Act, which, among other things, is the biggest climate bill in the history of the United States, in fact, the history of any country. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, my opponent, who I know, who I respect, uh, we live in the same town, we see each other in the community, he has said certain things that I think are important that you know. One is that he intends to freeze, then cut. Freeze, then cut all non-defense discretionary spending. That means freeze then cut, spending for border security, spending for law enforcement, spending for environmental protection, spending for veterans health care, and the list goes on and on. We'll talk more about it tonight. I hope you'll join me in our effort to continue to move this district forward and protect our democracy most of all. Thank you for having me. Mr. Marriott, your turn for two minutes of introductory remarks. Thank you and good evening. Welcome to our guests. Thank you to our hosts. My name, of course, is Brian Marriott. I'm accompanied this evening by my amazing wife of 28 years, Michelle, and our son, the oldest of our three children. I spent 27 years providing financial guidance and education to families, business owners, and people from all walks of life. I've managed major West Coast markets for two of the largest financial services firms in the country, and I've served on the council and as mayor of San Juan Capistrano. In every job I've ever worked, there's always been accountability, a requirement that I produce tangible results and that the divisions I oversee perform at a high level. Unfortunately, accountability is missing in government and the results are simply awful. Government is failing us, government is broken. None more so than our current federal government led by President Biden 
and enabled by the support and votes of the progressive wing of the Democrat Party and, of course, our incumbent. Years ago, Mr. Levin told us he would be a force for hard left policies, and he is. We shouldn't be surprised. Remember that famous Maya Angelou quote, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. As for the things our district really needs, nothing. It's been four years of press conferences on the beach and broken promises. Tonight, Mr. Levin will begin sentence after sentence with words like secured funding and voted to invest and all kinds of action verbs that'll sound great. But when you hear these words, remember that every bit of this wild spending spree has created massive and very expensive consequences for all of us, especially our working families of modest income. This year, this election cycle, let's get this right. We can fix this. I look forward to our discussion this evening. All right, thank you, candidates. All right, we're gonna jump into the questions now. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question, and we're gonna start with Mr. Marriott. We're gonna switch uh, which candidate begins the question. Fentanyl is the number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18 and 45 and killed 107,000 of our citizens in 2021. U.S. Border Patrol agents have seized enough fentanyl at our border to kill millions of Americans. What will you do to stop this? So our children and our young people are being poisoned. This has become the number one cause of death for our children in Orange and San Diego County. This is not an addiction. This is not accidental overdose. These are poisonings, and it's very, very important to remember that. This is a supply side issue. Our country, our families, our kids are being overwhelmed. Mike Levin voted to move, to not move fentanyl permanently to schedule one on the narcotics list in this country, something even China did a few years ago. His anti-incarceration attitude has made matters 10 times worse for our country and our kids. We have to acknowledge that we have a crisis. We have to support the HALT Fentanyl Act and merciless sentencing because they are showing no mercy to our children and our grieving families. We have to support all the tools at our disposal, foreign policy, trade, global commerce, and hit Mexico and China as hard as it's going to take to slow this overwhelming supply. And we've got to put people, killers, behind bars. It is that simple. I am, I am the choice of law enforcement on this critical issue. We have the endorsement of every major police organization in this district that has endorsed, including San Diego Police, San Diego Deputy Sheriffs, Oceanside Police Agency, PORAC. They know that I will fight for logic, common sense, law and order, our families and our kids. This madness has to stop. Mr. Levin, two minutes to answer the same question. So. I think it's pretty simple. In order to deal with a problem, particularly as serious as this, you need to get a first-hand look. And the reality is that just a month ago, Brian admitted to the San Diego Union Tribune that he had never been to the border. Never. Not once. On the other hand, I have been frequently to the border, and I've actually spoken with the people at CBP and others who are directly responsible for drug interdiction. And based on listening to them, I have repeatedly voted to increase funding for border security. The facts are clear on that. You can look it up. So the other thing I hear from them at the border is that they want politicians of both parties, by the way, who will stop playing politics with this issue and actually work together to try to get something done. We agree that the scourge of fentanyl needs to be stopped. It is horrifying. My wife and I have two young kids at home. They are 10 and eight years old. There is nothing that I fear more than when they are 13, 14, 15, reading the reports in the schools, that they will be exposed to this junk and I will do everything humanly possible to get the scanning, the technology, the resources to the border that they need. And unlike my opponent, I've been, I will continue to go, we will continue to listen. The other thing I will say is that if you look at our record, we have voted for a lot of the things that he described. 
sanctions for foreign countries who are sending this stuff across the border. I agree we got to get tough with Mexico. I agree we got to get tough with other countries who are sending this junk across. And the methods that they are now using are disgraceful. I heard from the lead drug interdiction person at the border, at the Port of San Isidro, that they are now using, the cartels from Sinaloa and elsewhere, are now using children as young as 12 years old, putting this stuff in their backpacks as they go across the border. It's a disgrace. Let's work together rather than pointing fingers to stop this once and for all. All right, for our next question, we're going to be starting with Representative Levin. What is your position on the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act and why? Well, obviously, I support that legislation, Priya. I was proud to vote for it because I think that uh, it contains some very important things for the future of our nation, the future of this district. When you consider it is the biggest single investment in climate action in the history of the United States, the history of any country. When you consider that for the first time, Medicare will be able to negotiate the price of prescription drugs and that prescription drugs will be capped for Medicare beneficiaries at $2,000 a year. When you consider that insulin will be capped at $35 a month for people who need it. Look, I am a Democrat. I am also concerned about deficits and the debt. When Donald Trump ran for president, he said he would eliminate the national debt altogether in eight years. Instead, the Trump administration racked up $7.7 .7 trillion of debt. This past year, we reduced the deficit by $1.4 trillion. The Inflation Reduction Act is projected by the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget to reduce the deficit by $1.9 trillion over the next 20 years, largely by allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices. Now, remember that number, $1.9 trillion, because that is exactly the number that the 2017 Trump tax bill increased the deficit by $1.9 trillion. If you remember at the time, Paul Ryan said it would pay for itself. He supported it, even though it capped the state and local tax deduction at $10,000, which was a drastic uh, failure for so many working people in our district, including law enforcement, nurses, teachers, firefighters. Those are his values, to stand up for the wealthy, to stand up for the well-connected. I want to see a 15% minimum corporate tax rate, and we got that in the Inflation Reduction Act. If you own a small business out here, you don't pay zero. Neither should Nike or Whirlpool or Hewlett Packard or any of the big businesses in America. I'll stand with the small businesses. He'll stand with the big ones. All right, Mr. Marriott, two minutes to talk about your position on the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, so people are hurting. Real families are hurting. People in your neighborhood are hurting. Family members are hurting. They're struggling with the cost of living. They're struggling with anxiety. The current party in power, the current incumbent, the current president have no sense of that whatsoever. Not whatsoever. They seem completely unwilling to admit that this inflation is not transitory, that it is real and pervasive. We have to stop spending and stop the printing and borrowing of money. We have to reduce gas and energy prices, and we have to get government regulation, excessive regulation, out of the way of our small and medium-sized businesses who are struggling so mightily after recovering from COVID. Now, it is ridiculous, and it is a symptom of a broken Washington and a broken Congress to stand here and say something that started as the original Build Back Better got scaled down to a Baby Back Better, Baby Build Back Better, and now is suddenly, suddenly inflation reducing. That is absurd. Is it also absurd to say that capping a few prescription drug prices is going to save $1.9 trillion. I would recheck my facts on that one, Mr. Levin. It's not my the number. The whole not bill, number. the entire bill is poorly written, disingenuous, and will ultimately create more inflation to pile up on top of what our working families, now 70% of them in this, in this district, living week to week, paycheck to paycheck, and striving for overtime and additional hours, new jobs, to control and deal with what's going on in their life from inflation. All right, Mr. Marriott, I want to talk about businesses, small businesses. What does being business friendly look like to you? Please provide tangible examples of your decisions in past elected roles that directly helped businesses in your area thrive. Yeah, so 
Small businesses, which we just mentioned, I mean, they are truly, truly the lifeblood. They really are. We are so honored and proud to have the endorsement of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, the largest nationwide voice for small business who rated our incumbent congressman a 17 on a scale of one to 100. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Can you imagine 87,000 new IRS agents, which the Senate summary of the bill says are going to be for IRS enforcement. It is remarkable what that party is willing to do. And when I say that party, I don't mean your father's Democrat or your neighbor the Democrat. I mean the progressive movement within the Democrat party. That is where the trouble is. We have got to get business taxes low and permanent with long-term visibility. I worked with business owners and still do, 27 years. I've seen what they go through, the anxiety as they pour their life's blood and their life's work into their small business, often reinvesting their own savings instead of investing it outside their business. And then to have it threatened first by a pandemic and then piled on with wild government spending that already has doubled the cost of their business credit line in a matter of weeks. We have to end deficit spending and reduce the debt. We have to restore energy and independence, energy independence and lower prices. We must lower health care prices for our small business owners. And we simply have to get government gone. We can do this, but we can't do it. If we keep electing members of the progressive wing of the Democrat Party, we just can't. They just don't get it. They're activists. Mike Levin is an activist. He's not a legislator. He's not a businessman. <laughs> Representative Levin, two minutes to answer the same question. If, if it means, if being an activist me, means that I don't take a dime in corporate PAC money, Brian, then you're right, I'm an activist. If being, if being an activist means that I stand up for the working men and women of this district, our veterans, our military families, those who fight every day to make ends meet, then you're right, Brian, I'm an activist. I'm also the proud grandson of a World War II veteran who's a small business owner, had a carpet drapery and upholstery business. My parents were entrepreneurs. I worked in clean energy startups before going to Congress. I know that taking an idea and a dream and turning it into a business is very difficult. It requires courage, incredible courage, even in the best of times. And the reality has been we've been through some hard times these last three years. Because of the pandemic, 400,000 small businesses across the United States had to shut their doors. Millions more almost had to shut their doors. But I'm very proud of what we've been able to do. We've been able to put every single person back to work with the 22 million jobs lost during the pandemic. All are back to work with another half million on top of that. In this district, in this district, because of what we did, with the Paycheck Protection Program, with the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, we were able to get 20,456 small businesses grants to be able to help them through. Those businesses employ 241,000 people. That's just in this district. And you should know one other thing. Republican Orange County Supervisor Lisa Bartlett, who ran against Brian, because he likes to tout his business background. And I won't say the whole quote, because it gets nastier than this. And Priya said not to be mean, so I won't. But according to Lisa Bartlett, she said, according to public records, Brian Marriott has no job, no income, no business, no license. He is not a certified financial planner. And I'll leave it at that. All right. I want to move on from talking about businesses to beaches. Mr. Levin, we're going to start with you for this question. Our beaches are rapidly eroding, causing loss of infrastructure, jeopardizing coastal access, and threatening public and private property and our tourist economy. What specific steps would you take to ensure that this issue is addressed regionally, appropriately, and with the urgency it demands? Well, we are taking them right now. We are working hand in glove with the Department of Transportation, the Federal Railroad Administration, the Army Corps of Engineers, SANDAG, and OCTA. This is top of mind for me every day because we have the second busiest inner city passenger rail corridor in the United States connecting Los Angeles and San Diego. It's down right now and you're only as strong as your weakest link and we have two weak links, one in Del Mar where bluffs are collapsing, beaches are eroding, and another up in San Clemente where you had 100 yards of sand. I was just down there at Cotton's Point and now you've got riprap 
right against the tracks. And so we've got to do all we can, not just put Band-Aids on this. We get money every year. We got 11 and a quarter million dollars most recently for the low sand corridor. We got 40 million dollars for sand in Encinitas, Solana Beach, uh, and in San Clemente. Uh, over one and a quarter million cubic yards of sand just this last year working with the Army Corps. But we've got to have a big fix. And ultimately, there are parts of that rail corridor they're going to have to move inland because Mother Nature always wins. Now, with a background as an environmental attorney, with a background uh, understanding uh, the various uh, agencies at play, uh, I have tried every single day to figure out how we can move some of that money from the bipartisan infrastructure law, which very few Republicans voted for, by the way, but that bill has $36 billion in it for projects just like this. The Northeast Corridor is going to get $24 billion. There's $12 billion that is left. I've already advocated for multiple billions of dollars to come to this district, to come to this community and this region. And I'm working with my friends like Scott Peters all the way up the coast, north and south of here. And this, along with San Onofre, where you've actually got to have a plan. You just can't point fingers and complain. These are two of the biggest environmental challenges that we face. We've got to work together. It's not easy, but together we're going to get these big challenges done. And I'm honored to get every single day the opportunity to serve this community in that way, because I think I can do it. All right, Mr. Marriott, two minutes to talk about your plans for the beaches. I'll get to the beaches, but first I want to tell you that Mike Levin collects not just dimes, but quarters, dollars, thousands and tens of thousands of corporate PAC money it just comes through leadership PAC. It's a very disingenuous statement. And no matter what, and no, what, no matter what my corrupt Democrat or Republican opponent in the primary had to say, I do have an income. I take a dollar a share from a public charity that I'm very proud of, that I put 50,000 of our own money in to bring 25 years of experience into low-income areas and work with families and business owners that would not have access otherwise. And I'm telling you, that buck doesn't go very far anymore. So as far as the beach and the sand, this is the same conversation Mike Levin's been having for the last four years. <laughs> Everything that required a plan of action got a plan of task forces, blue ribbon commissions, caucuses that are member four or five, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts that will show you two, three meetings with one congressman sitting there, five staff members, and a couple of bureaucrats. That is not an answer to San Onofre. The Democrat Party has failed on that issue for 40 years. You said publicly, Mike Levin, that you couldn't see moving everyone's waste to one state. So we don't have a geological repository. We don't have that. Unfortunately, we just don't. They blew it up. But guess what? The app lives on. It is probably the best answer for that waste because it is very difficult to move 40-year-old waste, never mind five-year-old waste, never mind 40-year-old waste once, and they're going to try to move it twice. It might be our only hope, and that's interim storage, but that's not the best answer. And a failure of government, which is broken, has led us to this place. As far as sand on the beaches and bluffs, nothing's been done. You can't lie under the same bluff where three people died just a short two years ago. There isn't a grain of sand except a few buckets that's come in from this congressman in the last four years. There are no major projects accomplished, only pipe dreams for the future with line items that may never materialize. All right, Mr. Marriott, we kind of talked about this when we were talking about inflation. What steps would you take in the next 12 months to combat the rising prices of rent, gas, and food? And what in your background shows your commitment to addressing basic needs in our communities? This is so easy. This is, this is really the easiest answer. We can stop the madness stop what is quickly becoming historical, pervasive inflation that will be very hard to get a handle on if we simply make a leadership change in Congress this fall. It is that simple. There is, there is no business sense in the Progressive Caucus whatsoever. Many of you are heads of households. Many of you are business owners. Can you imagine, can you fathom Sitting down at the end of a crisis, whether you got through a sick relative, 
cared for an elderly person, lost a job, you got through that crisis, or your business had a labor suit or something, or, or, or a catastrophe, you got through that crisis, you sat down, having got through the storm, and said, hey, why don't we go borrow a bunch of millions and buy a bunch of cool stuff? It makes zero sense. I think every member of the Progressive Caucus, including the one on stage tonight, simply skipped Econ 101. They have stuffed... <laughs> They have stuffed this economy full of government borrowed and printed money. And for the young people out in those rooms and across the way and across the hall, your, your costs are already skyrocketing as a direct result. In San Diego, two months ago, if you had a $70,000 income and 20% to put down, you qualified to buy a $450,000 home. Now you qualify to buy a $350,000 home, and that is the truth, and that is because interest rates on 30-year mortgages are seven instead of 3.8. And it's remarkable what they're doing to the future with this foolish nonsense. Look, you spend enough money, you're gonna hit a few ideas, and Michael and I will agree on a few. We'll agree on a few. But timing, structure, smartness of the way you spend it and distribute it, we won't agree on anything. Okay, Representative Levin, two minutes for the same question. So the first thing, first thing I think is so important is you actually level with people. We were hit with an unprecedented pandemic uh, that uh, caused significant supply chain shocks. Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. That has caused significant problems with regard to commodities, with regard to fossil fuels. One thing that we need to do is stop being so dependent on fossil fuels, allowing people like Vladimir Putin and MBS and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and everybody else from dictating our energy consumption. And let's be very clear about this. Inflation is a global issue. And as I said before, in the United States, we lost 22 million jobs. Every single one of those jobs has returned, plus another 500,000. Unemployment is at 3.5%, which is at a 50-year low. Now, we all know prices are too high, which is why just a few days ago, if you talk about gas prices, for example, I asked that the Federal Trade Commission begin a federal investigation along with 30 of my colleagues. I led, the, led this effort into California's oil refineries. Because right now, you saw we have 17 refineries. Six went down all at once in September. And the prices just from the costs and the profits of those refineries went up from 64 cents to $2.18 almost overnight. I asked my team, has that ever happened before? The most recent time was in 2019. Five refineries went down, the price of gallon went up 34 cents. So you tell me, is something fishy going on? I think we all have a right to find out. More, moreover, moreover, we actually have a plan. We passed price gouging legislation that I helped to write. We passed legislation to crack down on these oil companies. Brian will never talk about the profits of oil companies because he has hundreds of thousands of dollars personally invested in them. And because those companies are behind the attack ads in this district right now. If you go and you look at who's behind the Congressional Leadership Fund, funding all these wonderful ads, by the way, I didn't know, my, my wife told me that I had a full-time catering business, I have a full-time delivery business. It's the American Petroleum Institute, Coke Industries, Chevron, Exxon, those are his friends, that's who he'll fight for. All right, I want to move on to education. Mr. Levin, this question's for you. We're hosting tonight's event at a premier community college that provides great services to all socioeconomic classes in our community. In what ways do you support the youth and our growing workforce? What are some examples of what you've done in your current position? Well, first of all, I am so incredibly grateful that I got to partner with your great president, Sonny Cook, to get this college a $1 million grant for your Technology Career Institute to help train the workforce of the future. And yes, we did do a press conference. There maybe was a photo involved, but uh, Sonny actually got the check. And that's the case with all the press conferences that we've done. We want people to know all the good things we've done. We actually have uh, brought a lot of resources to this community. When you look at the CHIPS Act, Chips and Science Act, you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, there will be tremendous opportunities for the uh, community college students here at uh, Miracosta to be able to work in those industries of the future. I believe in the old Wayne Gretzky quote, you know, the hockey player. He said, skate to where the puck is going to be not to where the puck is today, and we know that the, in the future, 20, 30 years out, the, 
the jobs in biotech, life sciences, clean energy technology. That's who we need to train, and that's what we're doing in places like here at Miracosta. But I also believe that a place like Miracosta and all community colleges should be free, and that we need to do all we can to reduce to reduce the cost of college. And this is something that we hopefully can work on on a bipartisan basis. I support the College Affordability Act, which would dramatically increase Pell Grants. It would dramatically increase the amount that the average student has for things like food and uh, housing. And look, the reality is this. What the president did, you can agree or disagree with it, but at the end of the day, it solved a symptom, not the problem. The problem is the cost of college. And the problem is also that federal student loan interest is far too high. So I also support legislation that would make federal student loans zero interest loans, because you ought to be able to afford to go to college. And again, this is something that we ought to be able to work on, but more people in both parties seem to want the issue. They're talking right over each other instead of trying to work together. I'm proud to, in every way that I can, try to get bipartisan results. And if you go to MikeLevin.org, you can see example after example of how we've done that. Mr. Marriott, two minutes to answer the same question. Yeah, so we're blessed with remarkable colleges, with, with remarkable community colleges and trade schools. It's, it's really quite something. Uh, unfortunately, if a child doesn't lay a good foundation down in K through 12, uh, they're not going to be as productive. They're not going to come along as quickly. It's just that simple. I mean, those are the early years. Those are the important years. And I think we, have long, we are long past the time where in 2022, we are still sending kids to a government-run school determined by their zip code. We can do so much better than this. Where we need choice, and I'll get to the bailout, but where we need choice and options for our parents and our kids is in the K through 12 space. We are failing our kids, and now they've got catch up from COVID. And I have, I have heard Congressman Levin say you can't give wealthy families money to go to the K-12 to the school of their choice. It's the easiest thing in the world to income test. That is such a lousy excuse. It is an excuse right out of the talking point to the teachers' unions, and it's long past time we got beyond that. Our kids are smart. They're hungry. They're anxious. They want to succeed at a young age. Our parents want what's best for them. They need choice options, charter schools, start up private schools, and why can we afford, why can we give kids free college, give them Pell Grants to go to whatever school they want to in college, but not K through 12? So it's a lousy excuse. As for the bailout, as for the bailout, look, Here's the remarkable thing and why government is so broken. When they bailed out the mortgage industry, they reformed it, okay? They, see, we've got to bail out everything the government takes hold of, but at least they reformed it. They're bailing out the student loan industry and they're not giving it a bit of reform, nothing. We're in the boat we're in because Obama took control of the college lending system in 2010. College tuition has doubled, endowments have doubled, and our kids have suffered. Mr. Marriott, what are some ways you're going to support our growing retirement community? Tell us about your strategy for the future of our elderly. I've worked with elderly people my entire career. I still do. Their anxieties come from their financial circumstances and their health. It is really that simple. Their financial circumstances and their health. Uh, elderly people, especially if they're not elderly people with with extraordinary means are very, very, very inflation sensitive. It is remarkable. I'm having the conversation three, four, five times a day as we campaign in this district from one end to the other. We have got to get a handle on inflation for the sake of our folks on fixed incomes because they can't go get those overtime hours. They can't go get a second job. They've got what they've got. And it's a terrible situation to have them feeling this anxiety and reading about it every day. So that's one thing. The second thing is we have got to make sure that we maintain a healthy, vibrant Medicare system that includes a lot of choice with private insurance for them. My opponent has introduced and got behind the most egregious health care plan that wipes out all private insurance, wipes out Medicare as we know it, destroys TRICARE as we know it, and somehow thinks that's a good idea. I will not let that happen to our elderly. I will not let the age on Medicare drop down to 50 or 45 or whatever your 
latest is, because the services are so strained now that in seven years, they're statutorily bankrupt and will have to discount funding to the hospital trust fund by 10%. And I just got done talking with people at the hospitals all over this district, and they're already losing money on Medicare. So we've got to fix it now for our Medicare recipients, not in seven years, leave them reading headlines for a year, politicians run around and get more videos on TV, and then fix it at midnight. No, no more of that. We run government like a business. We give people peace of mind about the future, and we make smart business decisions. All right, Mr. Levin, two minutes to answer the same question. Well, let me, let me just say to the last question, I'm very proud that my wife and I send our kids in fifth and third grade to great public schools. Not everybody, not everybody can afford 40,000 a year for school. You know, if you wanna know about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, all you gotta do is listen to Rick Scott. Rick Scott isn't any Republican senator, he's the guy responsible for electing Republicans to the United States Senate. And he talked about the Maya Angelou quote, believe people when they tell you what they're gonna do. Rick Scott said every five years, they're going to reevaluate whether Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know about you, but I don't trust Rick Scott, Ted Cruz, Mitch McConnell, or any of these folks with Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. We've gotta stand up and make sure that Social Security is there, that it's an earned benefit. They call it entitlement. I think you earned it. You paid into it. It needs to be there when you're ready to retire. We have a bill. We have a bill that would make Social Security solvent until 2100. He and his party don't like it because it would actually increase taxes on rich people. And they don't want to do that. They want lower taxes for rich people and to stick it to everybody else. When it comes to Medicare, for the first time ever, we are finally, finally breaking down Big Pharma and allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices. <laughs> Big Pharma didn't want any part of that, but we made it happen. We got it done. The Affordable Care Act has provided health care to tens of millions of Americans. We're doing all we can to protect and strengthen it. His party would do all they can to try to repeal it, which means if you have a pre-existing condition, you can forget about health care. And they have said this time and again, and they will do it if you give them a chance. Finally, Brian is on record as saying that he would privatize the VA. He said that if it were his decision, you would just give a gold plan, an Aetna plan to our veterans. Do any of the veterans here want that instead of the VA health care that they get? Do they want that? They want that? Okay, then you vote for him. And everybody who wants a better, stronger VA, you vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. I Levin, we're going to move on to talking about... I can't win them all. Remember the ground rules, everyone. It's remarkable. The veteran said he'd take it. All please. the college students... No, no shouting out yet. from the audience, please. Thank you very much. I think we have plenty of veterans that know what you're up to, Brian. All right, we're, we're moving on to the next question now. This is for Mr. Levin. You're going first. What do you think is the future of the coastal rail in the 49th district, and what specific steps will you take to preserve critical transportation infrastructure? Well, we talked about it before, so it's a uh, bit of the same uh, as before, but the bipartisan infrastructure law contains that $12 billion potential fund for us to go after, and I'm going to do everything I can with the relationships of trust and confidence that we've built with the Army Corps of Engineers, the Federal Railroad Administration, the Department of Transportation, SANDAG, and others to do all uh, that we can to get every dime in this district and in this uh, region. Uh, look, we just passed three of the biggest bills that will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in history. The Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, because you need microchips for all this clean energy technology uh, as well. Uh, there is a massive difference between the two of us. Massive difference between the two of us. Uh, as I said before, the attack ads that you see from the Congressional Leadership Fund, they are being funded by the American Petroleum Institute because they know I will stand up against them. We both want energy independence. We both want lower energy costs. I just want clean energy independence. I want solar. I want wind. I want battery storage. I want electric vehicles. And I want a grid of the future that can handle it all. And I want for our region to lead. And there's no reason that we can't create the good jobs of the future right here. Now, you should know when he was the mayor of San Juan Capistrano, when they passed a climate action plan or considered a climate action plan, he was a no-show. You should know that he wants to freeze, then cut. Remember freeze, then cut? All of these investments that we're talking about in things like clean water, in things like uh, any of the appropriations for our beaches, he would get you zero dollars. 
Can we get you zero dollars? The, the only thing I know that you're going to be able to do to get through this bureaucracy is if you go out and get a shovel yourself and try to get the sand on the beach. It's not how it works. It's simply not how it works. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes building trust and confidence. That's what I have fought every single day to do. And if you would have stopped playing politics for just a minute and actually seen what we were trying to do instead of spending the last five years running against me, maybe you'd, you'd know a thing or two about all the hard work we've done. Mr. Marriott, two minutes for the same question. Thank you. Incidentally, you can look it up, H.R. 1976, formerly H.R. 1384, 100% entirely repeals the Affordable Care Act, and Mike Levin is an original co-sponsor. It's government-run health care. Our nation, our nation will never recover. They couldn't even pull it off in Vermont. The size, population the size of Fresno, 100% repeals Obamacare, destroys Medicare, destroys TRICARE. That's where they want to go. Along the way, it's just goodies, blow smoke and mirrors, so you don't pay attention to the damage they're really trying to do. Uh, the problem is not how it works. It's that it doesn't work. That's the whole issue tonight. Government doesn't work. Government is broken. All this wheel spinning and paperwork shoving has gotten us nowhere. It's got a train we can't even take between counties, that is absurd, simply absurd. When I'm elected, I will sit down with transportation department officials, local officials, officials from our regional planning agencies, experts and engineers, and we will talk about what it is really going to require, what the big fixes are going to be. The big fixes, fixes, not buckets of sand. What has to structurally change, both financially and physically, for our region to be sound again, sound again. And by the way, since we're having a little fun tonight, these evil oil companies that are, by the way, no longer in our portfolio, Mike Levin owns through his Fidelity funds. He just doesn't know it. Brian, Brian he invested, he invested in offshore truth, drilling. Mike, he invested in offshore drilling. It's, you own some of those too, buddy. You just don't know what okay, you own. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question every now. Member, every member of Congress should be banned. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He brought this up, Priya. Every member of Congress should be banned from trading stocks. Chrissy and I put all of our investments in mutual funds as soon as we took office. He should pledge to do the same. Okay, we're moving on to the last question and then we're gonna go to some audience questions. Uh, Mr. Marriott, you get to answer this one first. We've kind of been talking about this all night, but do you believe we're heading towards an inevitable recession? If so, what will you do to mitigate the impact on American families and small businesses? Yeah, so the, one of the biggest things that we're gonna have to deal with here is energy. Uh, this is a serious conversation. It's something that we can no longer ignore. We've got a party in power that is so determined to make a transition and to try to do it overnight. They're willing to hurt people, they're willing to hurt their finances, they're willing to cause them great pain. We already have 12 to 15 percent of people in our country, elderly people, that underheat their home at night uh, in colder climates. We have three and a half million people that die around the world every year as per UNICEF because they're trying to heat their homes and they're trying to cook burning cow manure and twigs. Uh, China's funding coal plants all over the world. I mean, we, we have to be pragmatic about this transition. We have to be pragmatic. I mean, it's, it's time now. If we're going to have a healthy economy, we have to have logic behind our energy plan. The gas prices we're seeing are not, they have nothing to do with three P's or three E's, each one for excuse. They have nothing to do with any of that. What they have to do with that is a determined attack on fossil fuels, which currently provides 40% of our grid energy and almost all of our transportation needs. It's absurd. Mike Levin, when he was a freshman, filed a bill to ban gas engines across the country because he, Mike Levin, as a freshman congressman, knew what was best. There's the activist again. How healthy was that? How productive was that? That was absurd, and he knows it. That's why he didn't refile it again. Four or five press conferences, Not most true. of them on the beach, but he didn't refile it again. Not true. And then President Biden, in March of 2020, his exact words, no ability for the oil and industry to continue to drill, period. It ends. So that's what's happened. This has been a deliberate effort to drive up prices on fossil fuels. It's a fact. Not no, true. it's a fact. Not it's a true. fact. And, and you, you cannot have 
Listen, you cannot have a healthy economy with energy prices that are exploding and energy uncertainty. You just can't. This is foolish, it's naive, and it's going to cause great pain, mostly and relatively speaking, for our low to moderate income families. They are feeling it every day. We talk to them every day. You see the anxiety, the fear in their eyes, and this is going to continue until we get smart management in Congress and in the executive branch. All right. Mr. Levin, two minutes for the same question. Are we heading towards an inevitable recession? And what are you going to do to mitigate the impact on American families and businesses? So here is the reality. Uh, when you look at what has happened in the United States of America versus uh, virtually every other industrialized country, we have had inflation, there's no question, but this is a global phenomenon and we have done much better than many other countries because we've actually invested in people, because we've done everything that we could to get shots in arms, checks in pockets, get our small businesses running again. 20,456 of those small businesses just in this district alone. Uh, but also, we've got the Fed chair that was put there by Donald Trump, his hero, Donald Trump. And that's, that's also the same president, Donald Trump, since we're talking about gas prices, who went over to Saudi, Saudi Arabia, went over to Europe, went over to uh, see Putin, and basically uh, said they were all off the hook. He said that, uh, that Saudi Arabia had nothing to do with the murder of uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi because of oil, because they wanted to keep oil prices down. So I'm damn proud that Joe Biden is willing to stand up to the Saudis. He's willing to stand up to Russia. He's willing to fight for Ukraine. We've got to get off foreign fossil fuels. We've got to have clean domestic energy independence. As I said before, we both want lower energy prices. We both want energy independence. We just fundamentally disagree about how you're going to get from here to there. I believe that you're going to get there if you stop your dependence on foreign fossil fuels and Here's the other thing you need to know. I hear no plan from Brian at all. I hear pointing fingers at the other side. I don't hear a plan from him. I don't hear a plan on inflation from Donald Trump. I don't hear a plan on inflation from Kevin McCarthy. I don't hear a plan on inflation from Mitch McConnell. And if you elect them, their only plan seems to be, give us the gavels and we'll do something differently. But when push comes to shove, it's all about trying to drill more. That won't, take, that won't happen in, in uh, months or years or give more tax cuts to rich people. That's the only thing I hear from them, and we've got to think smarter than that, and we've got to invest in people again, and that's why we're doing better than most other industrialized countries, although we have a lot further to go. All right, now it's time for some audience questions, and I want to thank everyone who submitted a question. They were all very thoughtful. We're going to give the candidates one minute each this time to answer the questions. We're going to start with Representative Levin. What is your stance on the recent Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe versus Wade? I thought it was a horrifying decision. I believe that this decision should only between, be between a woman and her doctor. I don't believe that I don't believe that Ted Cruz or Lindsey Graham or Brian Marriott ought to have anything to do with that decision. I think, I think we need to codify Roe versus Wade. And I think if you look at Brian in 2018, 2020, and 2022, he filled out questionnaires taking the most extreme position. He can say whatever he wants in the next minute, but the record is in 2018, 20, and 22, he filled out a questionnaire. No exceptions for life, no exceptions for health, no exceptions for rape, rape and incest. And because now we're in a general election, he's gonna change his tune and give him a minute to do it. Go ahead, Brian. Mr. Marriott, one minute on your thoughts on the recent overturning of Roe versus Wade. You know, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, it was an incredible emotional time for our country. It is a right that women got used to, and uh, it, is, it was remarkable to see, <laughs> remarkable, it was remarkable, it was just remarkable to see the reaction in the country, understandable. Uh, despite Mike's continued lies and disgraceful ads as it regards my position on abortion. I've been consistent on this issue for years and He's it's been well consistent. documented. I believe abortion should remain safe and legal in the first trimester and always in the case of rape, incest, and when the life of the mother is at risk. I would never vote for a national I would never vote for a national ban or abortion laws in Congress. The Supreme Court has returned the issue to the state. This was well known in 2020. 
There are a couple of pro-life groups that put an asterisk next to my name because of my position in first trimester, and I've, I was just, I've always been very, very consistent about that. And that's, nothing has ever changed about my position at all right. on this Thank issue. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. Your time is up, and if you want to address that, we're going to have two minutes of closing statements at the end. This question is from a Miracosta student, and we're going to start with Mr. Marriott. What policies are you committed to in order to keep students safe from gun violence in schools? Yeah, this is, uh, it's remarkable to see the politicization with this issue here in California. We have very, very strong gun laws. We still have tragedies that occur almost annually. Uh, we have looked at the issue too often through a political lens and focused on one part of the issue only. It hasn't changed anything. Again, here in California, we've had terrible incidents and mass shootings. We have to look at the issue in a far more holistic way, far more holistic. We have kids committing suicide and taking kids out with them. It's awful. We've got to figure it out. We've got to get resources on the ground. We've got to get common sense on the ground. And we've got a, a, a good chance to make real progress on this issue if we can all come together, be smart about it, collaborative about it, and, con and consider all the options. All right. Representative Levin, same question, one minute. I can tell you one of the hardest days I've had in recent memory was drop, dropping my kids off. I, I drop them off at school every morning uh, when I'm home, dropping them off the day after the Evaldi massacre, hugging them harder than I had in a long time. Uh, the reality is that I support the amendment, uh, but uh, I am no friend of the NRA. In fact, the only F I've ever gotten in my life was from the NRA, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> because I support common sense background checks, I support doing all we can to come together in a bipartisan way like we did for the first time in over 30 years with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. But you should know that my candidate is the candidate of the radical gun lobby the most far-right gun group in San Diego, he gave them $3,000 for a champagne sponsorship. You can look that up. He believes Congress should not sponsor any, any federal gun legislation. None at all. Do we think that's right? I don't. I think we've got to come together and try to get something done to protect our schools and protect our streets, and that's what I'm going to do. All right, Representative Levin, the next question is for you to begin with. California is home to thousands of military members, both active and retired. Do you support reducing taxes on military pensions? No, absolutely not. In fact, I've tried to work with MOA, our Military Officers Association, tried to do all we can to strengthen uh, their retirement security. You know, it is an extraordinary honor to get to serve this community. We're right near Camp Pendleton. And getting to serve uh, with a community, with uh, the best base in the United States for the readiness and the preparation of our troops, uh, has been one of the true honors of this job, as has passing 19 bipartisan veterans bills. All bipartisan, all bipartisan. Look them up. Signed by the former president, signed by this president. Do everything we can for veterans' health care, homelessness, the GI Bill, transition assistance, workforce development. I'm going to continue to fight every single day as the grandson of a World War II veteran to make sure I do all I can to give back to those, our Marines, our sailors, our airmen, our soldiers, who have done so much for this country. And that will be every single day that I serve uh, what I will try to do for as long as I get to serve. Mr. Marriott, one minute for the same question. Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. California is home to thousands of military members, both active and retired. Do you support reducing taxes on military pensions? Yes, we should eliminate taxes in California and military pensions. We're, on, <clears throat> we're, one of just, we're one of just a handful of states that still tax our military retirees and their pensions. There is no reason, especially with our state tax rates and the punitive nature of them, to rub that salt in the wound, especially, especially when they're dealing with so much uncertainty about their health care and their families. It's remarkable, really. In Oceanside, people and new patients are still waiting 68 days for mental health. That breaks my heart. Mike with his gold level plan, me with my gold level plan, his subsidized by the federal government 72 by 72 percent. Yes, 72 percent for members of Congress. My God, do we need term limits? But anyhow, our, our plans, 
Our plans will get you, get you mental health in 12 days, okay? But if you're in Oceanside, you gotta wait 68. You can go to San Diego, drive to th San Diego, 37, okay? It's shorter, but then you're likely gonna be seeing the same person, so you have to keep making that drive every time you have to go thereafter. Cardiology, you have to go to San Diego 33 days. Pain meds, Oceanside, new patients gonna wait 43 days. That one, sh that one just shocks me. We have so much work to do, but it doesn't start with a government-run healthcare system. All right. Mr. Marriott, this is also from a Miracosta College student. From your perspective, what are the biggest issues impacting international trade and how can you help the issue? So the biggest challenge we're gonna have in international trade is the need now to reconsider uh, some of the passes that we gave Russia and China on the world stage. This is really gonna be challenging for our country. We currently have two remarkable countries with warm, beautiful people uh, led by very, very evil, mostly men, and they sit in two of the Security Council positions, the permanent Security Council positions in the United Nations. We're gonna have to, pardon me, in the, in the, um, yeah, the United Nations. We are going to have to, have to reconsider this. We rushed globalization, there's no question about it. We rushed it, and now we're gonna be in a tricky spot because we have to rethink some of this. You know, some of the things that we've talked about tonight Right, our reliance on China for chips and other things. As we relook all of these things, we're going to have to rethink where we've positioned them and what that's gonna to mean to global commerce. It's gonna mean some real challenges. I think it's gonna meet great futures for our Maricosta college student. Let's hope he never becomes rich because he'll immediately be a pariah. But if he does, and I hope he or she does, uh, we, can, we can figure it out and global commerce Thanks. in the future is a great career path. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. That's a difficult question to try to answer in one minute, but Representative Levin, you can give it a go too. Well, that's why I went over. <laughs> well, I'm very uh, proud that uh, my first year in Congress, we were able to negotiate the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, a bipartisan agreement, and I'm very proud that I was able to help secure $300 million as part of that agreement to clean up the cross-border pollution between the U.S. and Mexico, and we just saw a historic investment from the Mexican government of another $144 million, and if he thinks that's a, a press release or a photo op, you should ask my colleagues on both sides of the aisle what role I actually played. Here's the deal. Every year, one fourth, one fourth of a quarter of a, uh, one fourth of a trillion dollars, $250 billion in cross-border trade between the U.S. and Mexico. The last president wanted to close the border, remember? What we need to do is we need to speed up trade and speed up those who are trying to come over legally, legally. And that means that we need another port of entry. So I'm really proud that working with our delegation, Republicans and Democrats in the regional delegation, we got 150 million more for another border crossing at Otay Mesa too. That will help our commerce throughout this entire region. And the last thing I'll say is we need to do things in America with American steel, American iron, American workers. And that's what we're going to do with the bipartisan infrastructure law and with the Inflation Reduction Act is build things in America again. And I hope we can come together and get it done right here in this district. Thank you. We're going to do one more audience question. And I apologize if I didn't get to some of your questions. A lot of these were some of the topics that we already covered. So Mr. Levin, we're going to start with you. Do you support, we were just talking about this, term limits for elected officials? Well, you have a term limit for me right now. You can keep me or you can vote me out. I tell you what we do need. We need term limits for Supreme Court justices, I think. I think we need other forms of uh, court reform as well. But when it comes to Congress, I think what you need to know, he, he says he support, would support term limits. He said he'd support a, a constitutional amendment. He wouldn't necessarily support those for himself because he knows constitutional amendment wouldn't necessarily go anywhere. The reality is that the seniority system in Congress is all out of whack. I wish it didn't take 10 years, 20 years before you get to chair a committee. I'm honored that in my first term, I was able to chair a subcommittee on the House Veterans Affairs Committee for Economic Opportunity. I'm gonna fight like crazy each and every day to try to gain seniority in the Congress. But if he thinks he's gonna go there overnight and they're gonna hand him the keys, it's obvious he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. All right, Mr. Marriott, you brought this up to begin with. So do you support term limits for elected officials? You know what I just heard from Mike? It's really remarkable when the elite gets going. Term limits for thee, term limits for thee, but not for me. <laughs> so, 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 solar panels for thee, but not for me. And, and a bronze health care plan for thee, but a gold one for me. 
If you don't see tonight just how out of touch this progressive movement and the people in it are, you're not watching. Now, if you're a student, you may not be along the curve far enough. I might have thought the same way. But you realize in time, it is shocking indifference. It truly is. Do you even campaign in the moderate income areas of your district, Mike? Because I don't think you Every do. single day, Brian. Of course, Every single of day. Of course I support term maybe, limits. Maybe my wife we knocked on your door. We campaign on term limits. It is time. Congress never expected people to want to go to Congress and stay 30 years, and you can see what happens when they try. Not true. Not true. We're going to go to closing statements now, and we're going to start with the candidate who didn't start the opening statement, so that would be you, Mr. Marriott. You get to begin two minutes for your closing statement. Well, tonight went pretty much as I anticipated. <laughs> it, no, it really did. It really did. Uh, Mike found various ways to describe dozens of trivial laws he's proposed while hiding from us on the more substantial ones like government-run health care and the BREATHE Act, and don't even get me going on the BREATHE Act, BLM's legislative agenda, which shuts down all prisons, decriminalizes the border, it's quite remarkable, and he doubled down on every element of the Biden agenda and the hard left tax print, borrow, and spend agenda. Task force, commissions, caucuses, you can almost hear the buzz of paperwork shuffling and the wheels spinning. But in the meantime, you can't go to any single place in our district and see tangible results from Congressman Levin. Not a widened road, not a, not a refurbished commuter train, a strengthened bluff, not even a park bench. One renamed building, that's it. But along the way, you'll pass dozens of spots where Mike has held press conferences. You'll, spend, you'll pass a bunch of spots where he's filmed these crazy YouTube videos where he drags out council members unsuspecting to say, someday we'll get money for this and someday we'll get money for that. It's hard to make this up. It's really hard. You, you can't even make this up. You'll pass several spots. I said that already. See, that's how confident I was I wrote this earlier. Look, I realize... I realize government isn't easy, but they're not even trying, and that's not even funny, but it's the truth. And if you're a young person here tonight, you really have no idea how high the stakes are. It's remarkable. Your futures are at stake. Everything we heard tonight from Mike was all about handouts, handouts, handouts. But working people, confident about the future, building a business, looking for their company to grow so they can get a promotion, they don't want handouts. They want opportunity, uncapped opportunity. <laughs> Make a change, make a change, make a change. And if you're a college student tonight, please, God, please don't put a pill in your mouth unless it comes from a licensed pharmacist. Please don't do that. Listen, thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you, Mike, for your ambition and your spirited debate tonight, your family, your beautiful volunteers, some I always enjoy seeing on the campaign trail. Have a terrific evening. You can right. make a change in November. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. Representative Levin. We have one more closing statement. Representative Levin, two minutes. You can go ahead. Well, thanks again to Miracosta College. Thank you, Priya, uh, for moderating. Thank you, Brian, for being here. Uh, you know, Brian has uh, signs all over that say people over politics. That has not been my experience with Brian. You should know that when I first uh, became a member of Congress and I had my first town hall, in our city, in San Juan Capistrano, I called all the different council members to try to attend, and, and Brian answered the phone, and he said he couldn't make it because he was too busy trying to defeat me. That's what he said. That's not putting people over politics. He's been trying to defeat me since the second I took that oath of office in January 2019. He didn't do it in 2020. He's not going to do it in 2022. Here's the deal. If we really want to put people over politics, if we really want to have a united country, we've got to stand up for democracy. Again, we've got to stand up for democracy. January 6, 2021 was one of the worst days in the history of this country. One of the worst days in the history of this country. And in a video from last year, in a video from last year, Brian tried to blame the Democrats for January 6, 2021. It was outrageous. And for 17 months, he refused to admit that Donald Trump had lost. 17 months. So democracy really is on the line. And look, if that's what you believe, if you think Trump won, he's your guy. 
This is a Trump Republican. But on the other hand, if you think we got to move beyond and we got to build together again, then I'd be honored to have your support. <laughs> to all the young people, to all the young people that are here and all the young people at Miracosta College and watching, I want you to know this is your future. This is your democracy. Every day that I am serving, I am serving for you. It is my name on the door, but it is your office. Let's keep moving this district forward together. Can we move this district forward together? Thank you for having me, everybody. Have a great night. All right, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. We appreciate your enthusiasm, and I'm also going to put a shameless plug in that these two candidates will be having another debate on NBC7 on Friday at 6.30 p.m., so be sure to tune in for that. I'll be moderating that as well. Thank you guys so much, and have a good and safe night.